I lived with Dr. Lilly for many years and worked with him uh, in the States back in the 80s and 90s. So that's how I got to know about him. Um, he was a very dear friend of mine, loved him very much, and I loved his work. And I think it's actually underappreciated. I think he's one of the most important scientists of the 21st century, 20th century. So um, we've only got 20 minutes and then 10 minutes of questions. So I'm just going to launch right into it, OK? Um, he was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, 1915. His father was a, started one of the first banks there. And um, um, he was uh, one of the three children. Um, when he went to school, he was known as uh, Young Einstein, always making little bombs and blowing up parts of the house and that kind of thing. Um, this is him with his little brothers. Unfortunately, um, one of his brothers uh, died in an accident, and the doctor um, basically messed up and could have saved his life and didn't. And it's what made John decide to become a doctor and set him on a path of uh, healing and exploration for the rest of his life. That's him with his dog. Um, at school, he got involved with. Um, and kind of publishing and um, poetry and he um, he wrote a paper when he was 16 called What is Reality? And basically that set off as a meme for the rest of his life uh, with this uh, almost, I don't know what to call it, but he was extremely passionate all his life is to find out how the brain works, what we're doing on the planet, what's the future of humanity, etc. So, um, um, when he got to Caltech, his uh, first university, um, he had money to pay for it, uh, obviously with his parents being rich, but he actually got in uh, 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 free. So, his first scientific paper, um, he invented the first uh, machine that was able to record the electrical activity of the brain, because of Bavatron. Um, so this is a method of recording the moving electrical potential gradients in the brain. Uh, so this paper was presented in 1949. And he's asking, how can the mind render itself sufficiently objective to study itself? In other words, how are we able to use the mind to ponder on the mind? It is perfectly feasible for the intellect to grasp the fact that the physiological changes of the brain occur simultaneously with thought, but it cannot conceive of the connection between its own thought and these changes. So you can see very early on kind of what path he's going down. Handsome young man back then. That's his graduation photograph. Um, so obviously in his early years, he played what we'd be, he would call the consensus reality game. In other words, um, getting a wife, having sex, having children, this, <coughs> this kind of thing. So, this is, a, I think he went through two, maybe three wives. This is one of his earlier ones, Margaret. Having a child. Um, I think he ended up with two boys and one girl eventually. So this is his first lab. And that's him having a laugh with his assistants. I don't know what's going on there. Um, so he ended up going to, from Caltech to Dartmouth College and then the National Institute of Mental Health in Maryland. Uh, this is him working on the first, uh, first workings in the brain. So you've got to understand science back then, I mean even now, but he's working on monkeys as they do, the scientists, and of course they've cut off the top of the head and put probes in to study what was going on. Uh, John invented a uh, uh, kind of sheath thing so they can actually go in and out and the monkey's not going to die each time they go in and do one probing type thing. So he's interested in big brains obviously. Here's man's, here's dolphins, there's monkeys. Um, when he eventually get into the whales and dolphins, a sperm whale is 10,000 grams weight. So we're talking a brain about this size. Yeah, it's huge. There's a human brain, dolphin brain, as it looks like in the right colouring. So, at the National Institute of Mental Health, he thought, well, 
how do you study the brain sufficiently enough, um, you realize that you have to cut off the senses. There were some studies being done in Canada at McGill University at the time where they had students put cuffs on themselves and, and, and uh, shades over their eyes. And, but of course, it's not sensory deprivation. Yeah. So this was the first tank that was made. Um, 56, 57, this is 57. So here we have, absolutely crazy, um, somebody suspended in water in a diving tank and they had to wear individual latex masks with breathing tubes. Yeah, and here's the safety man sitting outside, cork, gravel, etc., etc. Um, vibration, you know, now nobody had done anything like this before. Now the interesting thing is that John went into such far out spaces, because he's going in there for days, and the water's moving, salt water, so he could just piss, you know, not a problem. You can't do that in modern tanks. Come in better. Um, so, but he was going to surf far out spaces. He realized he couldn't tell his fellow colleagues what was going on in his brain at the time because the Korean War has gone on, everybody's paranoid, they're playing around with uh, acid, don't have a clue what they're doing. John refused to do acid at that time in the tank because he wanted to get all the data down for tanks on its own. Acid work comes in later. Here's the breathing tubes. <laughs> Basically, look like aliens, yeah? And you had to make an individual mask for each person. So thankfully, we moved on. Here's the next tank. So again, it's kind of just a round open one, breathing tubes, oxygen coming in. But again, you've got this mask in your head, so it's not, it's not sensory deprivation, right? You're still feeling something. This is the latest high-tech modern tank. Cost about three and a half thousand pounds. No, sorry, 23,000 pounds. Um, you can get as many different ones all over the world, different prices. You can make your own, you can get kits, blah, blah, blah. This is a very nice tank, though, very interesting. It's called the Isopod. They've actually managed to take the electricity out of the tank and keep it by the pump. So, in fact, you've actually got no electrical fuel or anything around you. You can try it over here at Canada Wharf across the road. They just opened a new place. Beautiful tank. So, um, somebody introduced John to the idea of uh, dolphins. Well, actually, John's in the tank one day and he thinks, okay, what else has got larger brains than us and floats around in this medium all the time? Of course, the answer is dolphins and whales. And John was on a committee um, from scientists pre-NASA. I think maybe young Carl Sagan was there, military, and the question was put, do we put any money into trying to find an extraterrestrials? So this is late 50s, yeah. And John was the only one that said, well, what about studying terrestrials? <laughs> We've had dolphins and whales been around here for millions of years, have managed to survive. And they're like humans, they depend on each other. They can communicate 10,000 miles underwater. We can't go anywhere like that. You know, now we've got the internet and stuff, but now, but all these years ago, nothing, nobody could conceive of communication over 10,000 miles. So uh, he, he's floating, he goes, well, Jesus, I should go and look at, look at this kind of stuff. But what also kicked him off was because he was asked to do a meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, CIA, Army, to give a presentation of his discovery of the pain and pleasure centers in the brain. So he actually discovered where they were. And so he, to give the presentation, he said, I'll only do it if it gets made public, because you could see the possible dangers of abuse of this, yeah? So he does it, and then six months later, his security clearance starts to get messed up a bit. He's asked, he's asked to leave a lecture. A colleague gets to see the film that was shown by an outside government contractor that made small atomic bombs, and here was a donkey with an atomic weapon strapped to its back, heading through a mountain pass with a sundial on its head, operated by remote control, veered off course, pain, stayed on course, pleasure, within six months. So John was like, right, I had enough of that. I'm off to the Virgin Islands, I'll get funding, I'll start doing dolphin research. This is a place in the Virgins, they, had a, uh, they basically flooded a house right beside the ocean. <coughs> They brought in dolphins that had been injured, had been uh, found in the ocean, that were, they needed help. 
uh, this, kind of, this kind of thing. So um, this is Margaret Howe, uh, who volunteered her idea to do an experiment of living for six months with a dolphin. You might have seen the uh, documentary on the BBC about it lately. So she lived for six months. The only dry thing was her bed above the water. And she lived with this dolphin, Peter. Now Peter made it very clear within a few days that if you want me to learn some vowels to, which they did, they, they speak 26 words or something to get to. Basically he said, if you want to do that, you've got to help me and masturbate me at least four or five times a day. So that's what she did. And um, they got this amazing relationship and she said it was just like scratching an itch. Don't know what he thought about it, but you know, we didn't quite get to that you know, language bit yet. And they had an amazing relationship. Unfortunately, the place had to shut down. John, NASA was funding it a bit. John gave acid to dolphins a few times. Very controversial at the time, controversial now. But he had one dolphin that had been shot by divers underwater. We didn't go near the humans. Gave it the acid, let it be stored, back to communication with humans again. You know, so controversial, but John's the ultimate scientist, right? Boom. Here she is again in the pool. Beautiful relationship with this dolphin. So newspapers have started to pick it up. Uh, this is interesting, man and dolphin. You've got to understand, nobody knew nothing about dolphins since the Greek times. Nobody. They were looked upon as vermin of the sea. It was John that introduced this whole dolphin thing, people swimming with dolphins. Uh, you know, he pushed through the Marine Protection Act, worked with them for 30 years. Um, so the papers are really interested in this. Can man talk to the animals? This is a whole new thing apart from the apes, yeah? Because the Greeks knew it. They were Aristotle talked about it. You see it on their vases. There's John getting cosmic with the dolphins. So, first book, Man and Dolphin. Uh, he wrote uh, quite a few books about it. Dolphin in History. Mind of the Dolphin. Communication between man and dolphin. So, obviously, you get really, really quite heavily into it. That's Margaret Howe, maybe 10 years ago, the same young girl you see. Still friends with John there. Keep it still closed. It's John with the dolphin. So he started, uh, when he closed that down, he came to California, went from the hardcore scientist to human potential movement. Yeah. Was in situ in Esalen Institute. Started to meet with, you know, went to the Rica Institute in Chile. Blah, 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 I met Ram Dass, everything. Human Dolphin Foundation that started. Independence through communication, beautiful. Um, his last one work for the government was in um, California. And he worked with acid in a tank, legal at the time, yeah. They pulled all the acid out, and brought it back to Sandoz laboratories. People, um, had to give everything back, so all the scientists had to give all their acid back. And John, um, John basically is, he did a, put out a scientific paper in the underground in San Francisco, and everybody was heading out to India to drop, when they dropped acid. Nobody had a clue, they had no map. What the hell is going on? Nobody understood. Let's look for people that have maps, Sufis, Indians, blah, blah, blah. But when people saw John's work, because he was mapping, he was mapping um, areas of the brain that he recognized were the same as Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Um, so um, for the first time in the West, you've got uh, people in San Francisco going, well, wait a minute, this makes sense, actually, and this is from a scientific background. So John ended up lecturing in uh, yoga schools around the world. So years later, this came out as the book that was the uh, published underground paper programming and metaprogramming in the human biocomputer. Bio so he's the first one to use the analogy of the wet wear software of the brain. You realize you're born with certain programs, eat, sleep, shit, fuck, all the rest. But you've got your, pro your programming from your parents and then programming from your schooling and society. Not necessarily the best programming for you. So what he's interested in, how do you go in 
and reprogram yourself and get into metaprogramming. So you're looking down at the lower ones, you can get more and more higher metaprogramming. Very difficult book to read, but uh, absolutely fascinating. Tim Lee thought it was one of the most important top ten books of the, the century. Um, you know who that is, Robin Williams? So John set up um, five or six tanks up at his ranch in Malibu and invited scientists, um, artists, people from Hollywood, obviously they were very interested in his work, to come up and use the tank. They were great friends for many years. That's Burgess Meredith, if you remember him, the Joker. Is it the Joker? Yeah, I think the Joker. And Batman stuff. Um, so there, John realized back in the 60s, really the only way you're going to get to dolphins to communicate is when they have computers. He knew it'd be 30 years later. So this is them playing around with the early computers. John started getting into echo. He's talked about when he was doing various experiments with the psychoactives, that there was a galactic coincidence control office, and then there was an earth coincidence control office, and if you take care of your short-term coincidences, then echo would take care of your long-term ones. So he always had a kind of meeting with beings and things. Um, of course, John starts to meet everybody, Albert Hoffman, um, that's his wife, Tony. He was with her many years, so basically helped him with the whole social affair of hosting people, all these people coming to his house, looking after him. It's a nice little letter to John from Albert Hoffman, to my dear friend John. Yeah, very beautiful. Um, so Hollywood gets interested. George C. Scott plays John in The Day of the Dolphin because basically the second thing that happened with John with the government stuff is the, um, what do you call it, spies from the Navy were going into his research place in St. Thomas and spying on him because they ended up using him for Vietnam, you know, planting mines onto ships, blah, blah, blah. They still do it. I thought the best thing was the last Gulf War, front of the newspaper, very happy dolphin trainer, brought them over from the States. Here's the dolphins we spent a million pound dollars on training. First day, two dolphins in the ocean. First one just goes off looking for sex and never comes back. Love it. So, um, Altered States, um, produced by Ken Russell. Fantastic movie, very far out for Hollywood. Great film, if you haven't seen it, see it. Um, there's with Timothy up there and um, Alan Ginsberg. Yeah, they don't. Um, ask Oscar Janiger, if anybody knows who he was, he was a psychiatrist that gave LSD to Annie Snin, Andre Previn, Jack Nicholson, uh, was one of the most lovely people I met on the planet. Um, Cary Grant loved acid so much, he wanted to make a film about it, he did about 300 times with him. He got everybody to paint a wheat show, no, a uh, not, Kachinko doll, before, during and afterwards, and paint. And that was the therapy you know, to, to, to see what was going on with it. That's John Allen, uh, started the Biosphere 2 project, that's why... John's got his bias for a two hat on there. Now they've been friends for many years. Nice photograph there. That's with Laura Huxley, Oscar Janaga, e uh, Carolyn Cleveland, who's an artist, Timothy, and Nina Graboy, who's one of the LA psychiatrists working with LSD. <coughs> That's um, yeah, Ethnobotany, what's his name, sorry? Schultes, Dick Schultes, and John Allen there. That's the same one with um, Ginsburg. Nice one, John. I'm zooming through here. That's John at Timothy's house. They were very best friends until he died. I don't know how he does that. Going to add. Um, that's one of the tanks at John's house uh, with his wife, Tony. Wrote uh, 13 books, 120 scientific papers. Sent to the cyclone, first one. Second one, um, Diadic Cyclone with his wife. Simulations of God, which is out of print. Fantastic book. Each chapter, God is money, God is sex, God is drugs, God is religion. He simplifies it, you know? It's like, let's really get down to the basics. It's all about belief systems. We'll get into that in a second. Scientist is our biography. Altered states again. <laughs> uh, that's me in my bedroom with John, uh, a bit younger, with uh, my tank. This is at Timothy Leary's funeral with, you know, who's there, Nina Graboy again, Ram Dass, and Mr. Wilson, and me with my specs on behind there. Okay, um, you can read that yourselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
That's actually a painting. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> so John lectured around the world for the rest of his life, speaking to, for example, the Japanese and saying, what are you doing? You're killing all these dolphins and whales. So he introduces like NTT, second largest communication company in the world, as the grandfather of communication. So they're all sitting there with their, I don't know, I don't know. Then they start saying, he starts talking about mushrooms and ketamine and things and all like, but Dr. Lydia, oh, we don't get these things here in Japan. How do we get them? And John's like, well, first of all, get yourself a cow. Cow shit, you get the magic mushrooms. You got a cow, you need a vet, you can get the ketamine from the vet. So it's, uh, it's all getting translated, you know. <laughs> He was a naughty boy. But he'd also like speak to like, you know, there's Olympic swimmers and John would, you know, say, well, did you masturbate the dolphin and stuff? And what the what the fuck was he talking about? And you say to John afterwards, why are you talking about sex with dolphins? He said, because I've been telling them for years to stop killing them, eating them. If it's maybe talk about sex, they might. So, can you read that? No, I'll read it out. So his famous meme. In the province of the mind, what one believes to be true is true or becomes true within certain limits. When these limits are so found, they are for their beliefs to be uh, transcended. So, well, sorry, to be found experientially, experimentally. Limits are for their beliefs to be transcended. He will add on later, in the province of the body, there are definite limits, as he tried to push them. Does anyone know who that lady is again? She's a famous psychiatrist, worked with LSD and stuff? No? Can't remember. Betty Eisner. Betty Eisner, well done. Thank you. And Oscar again. Laura Hawks, a very close friend for many years. Um, one of the most lovely ladies I've ever met. Is a young me. Richard Feynman used to come and use the tank. Had about a 10 year argument over the word hallucinations. John didn't like to use the word, didn't make sense, not scientific. When John was sick in the hospital, he would come and um, play his... What did he play again? It wasn't ukulele, it was some wow. instrument. What was it? Bongos. Bongos, you're probably right. So he played for John when he was in a coma and everything. The Deep Self, his work about the flotation tanks, fantastic book. Responsibility starts with a satisfactory coalition between oneself and the demanding 10 trillion self of one's own body. That's from Program and Meta Program. He loves Star Trek. He's a little bugger man. I used to live outside the house in the caravan. He'd call me at least three, four times a day. One word, John's very minimum. It's on. Two words, sorry. Come and come watch Star Trek again. I've seen them all millions of times. John in Japan. That's, another, that's the next issue of The Scientist. I've seen that one. It is with Albert again. There's Albert and Tim with their famous LSD and psilocybin. Uh, it's from the front cover of the first uh, dish of the Floating magazine. Ah, I'm doubling up here. John moved to Maui in the last um, five years or something, or seven years of his life. Very happy there on the beach. Dolphins. Pretty ladies. All that stuff. He loved it. Okay. Uh, John in Switzerland. We on to our last one. Um, this is um, George Carlin's tank, which I set up for him. He was very happy. He just had a heart attack. His wife called me after his first float came out. Said he said it was just like his first acid trip. He loved it. So I'm going to read out one more time at the end. The problems of the mind. What is believed to be true. Is true or becomes true within certain limits to be found experientially and experimentally. These limits are further belief to be transcended. And the problems of the mind there are no limits. So you can see through his life, he's working towards this. You know, he's 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 changing slight words, his ideas until he gets that, and that's the most important part of his work, as I believe, is this. Um, there is no limits. You know. Uh, okay, so um, as far as the talk's concerned, I'm finished. Thank you very much.